Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 8, verses 2 through 11. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and he taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. But Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and he said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote in the ground. But when they heard that, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she says, She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. If you are a guest of ours today, we wanted to let you know that our theme this year is that of focusing on being made in the image of God, created in His image initially in the way He formed us from the dust of the ground, the first man, and out of Him made the first woman, and then separated from God by sin, we have been recreated in His image through Jesus Christ. And it's in the image of Jesus that we seek to be transformed day by day as we walk more closely in His steps. So as those who have been created in His image and recreated in the image of God through Jesus Christ, we seek to be holy as He is holy. We seek to love as we have been loved. And this quarter we're focusing on forgiving as we have been forgiven. So before we can even talk about how we respond to one another, how we react to one another, speak one another, when we cause offenses to one another, which inevitably we will do, we have to build upon the foundation of daily acknowledging how much we have been forgiven, looking at how God forgives, looking at how Jesus forgave in His ministry, and that's what leads us to our text this morning. Maybe somewhat surprising to you that, that I, I chose this text because I typically don't choose texts that are under any cloud of question as to whether or not they belong in the canon. Uh, that's why when I talk about the Great Commission, I go to Matthew chapter 28 instead of the end of Mark chapter 16 because of the questionable status of Mark chapter 16 verses 9 and following to the end of the chapters. Some of the best manuscripts don't have those verses and so I don't want to build a case on anything that somebody might raise a flag and say, well you got a faulty argument there Tim, pretty, pretty weak evidence. Did you read your footnote that, that some manuscripts don't even have that? So I go to Matthew 28 instead of Mark 16 for the Great Commission rather than Mark 16, 15, and then rather than Mark 16, 16 to discuss uh, the place that baptism has in our response of obedient faith to the grace and mercy of God, I go to the plethora of other scriptures. No need to build a case on Mark 16, 16. Same thing with Acts 8, 37, the confession of the, the Ethiopian. Questionable verse. That's why your translation may have a verse 36 and a verse 38 with little to no explanation as to why there's not a verse 37, except in a footnote. Uh, so I, I tend not to make too much out of questionable texts, but defer to others. And this is one of those texts, and you can check it out in a footnote in, in your translation, beginning at chapter 7, verse 53, on down through chapter 8, verse 11. And here's the evidence. Uh, the best manuscripts, the oldest manuscripts, don't have this section in them. 
as familiar as the story is to us from most of the English translations that we use. Um, some manuscripts in which it begins to appear have it placed elsewhere in John, either at two or three different places earlier in chapter 7. Some manuscripts have it after chapter 21, verse 25, which if you turn in your Bible to John 21, 25, that will appear as the last verse of John. And in some manuscripts, this story appears at the end. It just kind of has the feel of something that was added later. Some manuscripts have it at the end of Luke 21, uh, not, not in John at all. So manuscript evidence, not so strong. Thematically, it's rather out of place in the Gospel of John. He doesn't address adultery or sexual sin of any kind in the remainder of his Gospel. The vocabulary in this section is different. If you, those of you who have had uh, some Greek and you start translating uh, Greek into English, one of the first places you'll go in the New Testament is John. Either the letters of John or the Gospel of John because as New Testament Greek goes, uh, John's vocabulary is rather simple and rather repetitive. Not as many vocabulary words that, that you have to use with John. And so the, the vocabulary list here is, is a little different. Fifteen words that don't appear elsewhere in John, and four of those words don't appear anywhere else in the New Testament, period. Uh, if you exact that out and just go from chapter 7, verse 53 to chapter 8, verse 12, you really don't miss a beat. It's still about the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus has been making proclamations. Beginning in chapter 12, he makes another proclamation. So you could excise that from, from the text, and it would not really be affected that much. Um, so for those reasons... Many scholars, most scholars, commentators would suggest that this probably wasn't original in John's gospel, as reflected in those footnotes in your Bible. So why is it there, and why would I devote a message in our series on forgiveness based on a text that has some questions about it, which is, again, rather uncharacteristic for me? It's because simply because something is non-canonical doesn't necessarily suggest that it's non-historical. Everything about this story seems like Jesus, reads like Jesus, reacts like Jesus. John tells us himself at the end of his gospel that he had to be discerning with the Holy Spirit's help in choosing what to include and what to not include. And John says, you know, there was just so much there, some things didn't, didn't make the cut. Verse 30 of chapter 20, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Same with the last verse of chapter 21, verse 25. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Since this was added, apparently, to manuscripts of John later, this is probably, in all likelihood, is my conviction that this is one of those early Jesus stories that wasn't originally recorded by Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. If you read Acts chapter 20, verse 35, Paul, in talking with the elders from Ephesus, throws out a quote of Jesus, a quote from Jesus that we would know nothing about if he doesn't mention it there. He says to those Ephesian elders, remember what Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. You know, you can scour Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you won't find those words of Jesus. It was a Jesus saying. None of this was written down yet anyway. It was being passed along orally. So there were undoubtedly many Jesus stories that were circulating that weren't included in canonical scripture. And ultimately, this one gets attached to the Gospel of John. But it is so very much like Jesus, so characteristic of the Son of God and is so familiar to us and teaches such powerful lessons that I wanted to examine it together this morning. Looking back at verses 2 through the middle of verse 6, early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women, so what do you say? 
This they said to test him, that they might find some charge to bring against him. Jesus is in the middle of what we would call a Bible class at the temple. He goes to the temple early in the morning, and he takes that rabbinic position, assumes that rabbinic posture of being seated, and he starts to teach them like he did so many days in the temple. In fact, he would challenge the Pharisees. Why why are you doing these things in secret? I'm teaching in the temple every day. I'm healing in the temple every day. You could arrest me anytime you want to arrest me. So Jesus, this could very well have been material like sermon on the Sermon on the Mount, but this is going to be the Sermon on the Temple Mount. And this is very quickly and starkly and rudely and rashly interrupted. The approach of these scribes and Pharisees who bring this woman to Jesus, that their actions are rash and rude, their attitude is rotten, and their motives reek. Because there's just so much about the scenario that that raises questions that that aren't answered. How was she discovered in the very act of adultery? Where is the man? They make the statement, the law of Moses says, such a woman should be put to death. Well, you go back and you read Leviticus 20 and Deuteronomy 21, and as you would expect, it says two people should be put to death under the law. So where, where is this man she was with? Where is her husband? Does he have no interest in in what's going on? So the whole thing just sort of has a bad smell to it. This woman, regardless of the supposed truth of the accusation against her, was sadly being objectified by the scribes and the Pharisees. She had been depersonalized. She was being manipulated and used to get to Jesus. And that was their real goal. And that's what John says, what they did this to test Jesus so that they might bring some charge against him. They had no concern at all for the amount of public shame and humiliation and disgrace that they were bringing upon this woman. They didn't stop to consider, what if this woman were my daughter? What if this woman were my sister? What if this woman were my mother? They didn't have the tenderness, they didn't have the love, they didn't have the compassion of Joseph who didn't want to expose Mary to public shame when he suspected her of the very same thing that this woman was accused of. So the scribes and and Pharisees have totally neglected, passed over, and are not in the least bit respectful of the personhood of this woman. They did not care about her past. They didn't care about her future. They really didn't care about her guilt or her innocence. They didn't care about her family or her friends. They didn't really care if she lived or died, depending on the answer of Jesus that they might get. They really didn't care whether she went to heaven or to hell. They were concerned about issues. They weren't really concerned about people. And she was just an object. She was just an issue. She was just a means of getting at Jesus. She meant nothing to them. But this woman means everything to Jesus. And that's why he responds like he does. The text doesn't tell us, but this woman had a name. A name that was given to her when she was born by her mother and her father. And Jesus knew her name. Whether or not he had ever met her before, nobody knows, but Jesus knew her name. That's the way he calls all of his sheep. He calls them by name. This woman just wasn't an an object, just wasn't an issue. She was a person, and she was a person who had a story. Was that story a a loveless marriage? Was it an abusive marriage? Was it a marriage of convenience? Was she truly in love with the man with whom she was caught? And many people then, as many people today, maybe some of you might be saying, well, what does that matter? I think it did matter. I think those things did matter to Jesus because she mattered to Jesus. So to some people, this was just an issue. This was a scandal, a sin. Maybe it was a a setup. But in the eyes of Jesus, this this was a daughter of God who had been created in His image and whose life and whose heart needed to be reclaimed. Her story 
was a story that was worth redemption. And her story, her narrative, was one that was worthy of a dramatic, eternity-altering change. So pick up with me reading again in the middle of verse 6 down through verse 8. After, they, they, after John says they were doing this to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him, it says that Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. So the scenario is, Jesus, here's the answer we want from you. What should we do with this woman? The law says she should be put to death. One of the backstories, part of the meta narrative, was that by law they weren't permitted to put people to death. At least they're handy to use that as an excuse when it serves them well. When they bring Jesus before Pilate and Pilate wanting to rid himself of the situation says, if you want to kill him, kill him. If you want to crucify him, crucify him. And they say, we can't. It's not, it's not lawful for us. That didn't come up when they drug Stephen outside the city. That didn't come up when they drug Paul outside the city of Lystra. They could appeal to it when, when it served uh, their, their purposes. So what are you going to say, Jesus? Are you going to back up the law on this? What Deuteronomy 22 and and Leviticus 20 say? Are you going to follow Roman law? Are people going to be able to to charge you uh, uh, with, with being lacking compassion? So rather than answering them quickly and directly, the New American Standard, uh, excuse me, I've said that for 30 years, the English Standard Version says that, that he bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And, and bending, I don't know, depends on how well you can bend. Uh, you can bend down and, and write, but I don't know if, if that's what he was doing. If, if he bent down this way and he wrote, or maybe he bends down on one knee, and he begins to write with his finger. The only thing it ever says Jesus wrote, by the way, You can't read anywhere else in the Gospels that Jesus wrote anything except here. And and he's writing in the dirt with his finger. And I think he does for quite some time. Because they keep asking for an answer. They keep questioning, tell us that they're getting a little irritated because he's not answering their question. So they keep asking, what should we do? Should we follow the law? Should we not follow the law? You give give us an answer. The question always arises, what did he write? What what was he writing? Uh, Some say, well, he may have been enumerating the the Ten Commandments. He did write those, by the way, uh, a long time earlier. He knew what the seventh one said, by the way. Some have suggested that maybe he's writing down the names of the accusers and enlisting their sins. It's all speculation. We really don't need, uh, we, we really have no way of knowing. I think more important than what he wrote was that he was writing, that this was his means of response, that he didn't just outright answer the question. And while he's writing with his finger, they're saying, What are you doing? Can you hear us? Are you listening? Are you going to give us an answer? And as always, Jesus answers in good time. He answers in wise time, in discerning time, in deliberate time, his own time. He couldn't be pushed, nor could his buttons be pushed, and he couldn't be rushed. I think we would be wise to remember that in the age of Facebook and Twitter and other social media. Those words, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, were custom constructed for the social media age. Ready, you know, fire, aim, sort of that order. We we go in in our responses on social media. Thoughtful, prayerful responses. Who's got time for that? This is real time, Tim. You know, I just got a notification. I've got 30 seconds or less to respond. So we bang out an immediate response. We check it for truth and kindness and grammar later. That's what the edit feature is for, by the way. Once you review it for truth and kindness and grammar, you can always go back and and change it if, if you fired too fast. So Jesus takes his time. And he's also giving them time to think. And so when he stands, and I think when he stands up, he's got that... God in the flesh, air of authority about him. 
when he says, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he bends down and starts writing again. In silence. And he lets the silence do the talking for him. He lets the silence speak into their hearts and their minds and their lives. But the one who is without sin be the first to cast a stone. And maybe they start doing that moral inventory. Maybe trying to see if, if they qualified, if they met the criteria. Could I cast that first stone? Their hatred of Jesus alone and their desire to kill him was as evil as anything this woman had done. In their hearts, they want to murder the Messiah. And in their hearts, they are convicted of that and multitudes of other sins in their lives. So pick up reading with me again in verse 9 down through the end of verse 11. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. I don't know if they had stones already in their hands or not. It's kind of one of the images behind the, the banner for this quarter. Forgive as, as you have been forgiven. I don't know if, if they already had the stones in, in their hands and they began to release those stones. And, and we'll ultimately talk about pretty soon being able to forgive ourselves and not carry around stones against ourselves but rather freely and openly and trustingly accepting the forgiveness of God. But whether they had the stones in their hands or not, whether they dropped them or not, I don't know, but one by one they gradually walked away. And the text wants us to know that they kind of went in birth order when they did that, starting with the oldest down to the youngest, which has got to be there for a reason. So what's, what's the reason? Is it because being older they had more sins? Is it being older they had more sins? I kind of think it was probably both. More sins and more sins. And they realize how totally unqualified they are to respond to the instructions of Jesus. And so they just begin to walk away. Until it was Jesus and the woman alone. And I get the picture when Jesus is teaching this Bible class in, in the temple that there's kind of a larger crowd and then there's the, the circle of disciples and then busting into the circle are the scribes and the Pharisees. And it sounds like everybody leaves. Not only the scribes and the Pharisees, but the disciples just find something else to do. And the crowd kind of walks away as well. Just leaving Jesus and the woman and he's been down riding on the ground. She's standing up. So he stood to meet her eye to eye and face to face. And so he asked her a couple of questions, not that he was lacking information. He knew where they had gone and he knew why. But he says, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And probably with a quaver still in her voice and fear beginning to depart from her shaking body and relief beginning to overwhelm her, she said, no one, Lord. And that relief was capped by Jesus' proclamation that neither do I condemn you. Go and from now on, sin no more. The world finds every opportunity it can to condemn. Sometimes the church does the same thing. Jesus looked for opportunities to forgive. That's why God sent him in his love, so that believing in him, the world might be saved, John 3.16 says. Verse 17, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The only one who was qualified to cast a stone didn't. The only one who met the criteria, the only one who was without sin among them chose to offer and extend forgiveness instead of condemnation. A verdict? Well, it w wasn't really needed. No one, including herself, was disputing 
the facts of the situation or disputing her guilt. There was no sentence that was pronounced. She had already suffered enough guilt and shame already for a lifetime, probably just within the span of an hour or two, and so time served was good enough for a sentence. He just offers her forgiveness and acquits her and changed the course of her life and her eternity. Probably no one had ever spoken to her that way. No one had ever treated her that way. Like Rahab in the Old Testament, this woman had a past. Jesus gave her a future. And she would never feel the same way about herself again. Jesus says, go, and from now on, sin no more. Did this woman ever sin again? If this was a human woman. She did. But now she knew where to find forgiveness. Now she had a reason to try to live as God wanted her to live in the first place. And I love to envision this woman, and I started to give her a name, and that's always dicey because you always pick somebody's name that's, you know, here. So in my mind, she has a name, but um, Jesus knew her name. In my mind, I, I love to envision her as a part of the early church in Jerusalem. You don't think she just disappeared, do you? Don't you think she was drawn to this one who was qualified to cast the first stone and didn't? Wanted to find out as much as she could about him when she heard salvation proclaimed in his name. Maybe she was a part of those 3,000 on Pentecost or among the many more thousands that, that soon followed who were baptized into Jesus Christ. And she was known to Peter and Andrew and James and John. She was known to John Mark and John Mark's mother, Mary. Known to Jesus' mother, Mary, and to his brothers. Served there alongside other sisters and brothers in the Jerusalem church. I would love to believe that that's how her story continued. While there are many differences that I see between myself and Jesus in this situation and in this story, the one that strikes me the most, the one that convicts me the most, the one that shames me the most, the biggest difference between me and Jesus is that Jesus deep down wanted to forgive and save the scribes and Pharisees too. And I'm pretty hard on them. I, I find myself not wanting to have much compassion for them at all. For using this woman, manipulating her, trying to get at Jesus through her. Jesus died for the scribes and the Pharisees as well. He wanted to forgive them too if they could find repentance as this woman had in her heart. Forgive as you have been forgiven. We have been forgiven as this woman was forgiven. And when Jesus stands with us, there is no condemnation. Some powerful verses from Romans chapter 8 before we close. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so those questions that begin to come in verses 33 and 34, near the end of Romans 8. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us, and that's why there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. And then we'll close with 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 7 down through chapter 2, verse 2. <clears throat> 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, down through chapter 2, verse 2. But if we walk in the light, as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. We have someone who stands with us, with the Father, and that is Jesus Christ, 
the righteous. This woman was condemned and facing death, and Jesus was her only hope. Jesus was her only plea. We stood condemned and facing death because of our sins. Jesus is our only hope. Jesus is our only plea. Let him stand with you this morning if you've never availed yourself of the power of, of his cleansing blood. If, if you haven't yet proclaimed your faith in him, turned from sin as this woman undoubtedly did in her heart as she was brought to this crucial moment in her life. Follow his instruction. Be united with him in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins and, and let him say to you, neither do I condemn you. Let Jesus be your plea this morning while we're standing and singing together.